It's day two of Advent of Code, and we're about to solve another fresh and exciting coding challenge using functional programming in JavaScript. Today's challenge is all about a rock, paper, scissors tournament. We're given a list of inputs that comes in two columns, where the first column represents the opponent's move, and we think that the second column represents the move that we should play. The elves are being a bit secretive about it, so we don't know for sure. But basically, for the opponent's move, A represents rock, B represents paper, and C represents scissors, and then we think that for our move, X represents rock, Y represents paper, Z represents scissors. Now, there are some specifics about how the scoring is working in this tournament. So basically, we get points for winning the game. We get six points for winning a game, three points for a draw, zero points for losing. But then we also get additional points based on what move we play. So we get one point for rock, two points for paper, three points for scissors. And then we basically just add that to the score of the game outcome. So we'll start by pasting in our sample input, and then I just want to make a few notes about what all these things represent, just so we don't have to keep looking back at the problem description. Our game plan for this puzzle is to start by writing a function that's going to give us both the game score and move score of the game. So basically whether we win, draw, etc. Then we want to get the scores of all the games and then add them all up. So kind of similar to the last problem we were working on. Since the input comes in the form of a string, we'll just start by breaking that up using the dot split function like yesterday. And that'll give us an array where each element is a string that basically is just gonna be the opponent's move, a space, and then our move. So we'll just take the first one of those to use as a sample game so that we can test out this function that we're gonna write that's gonna give us the score. The first thing we wanna do in this function is to basically isolate the opponent's move and our move. So we can use the split method again to do that, but now instead of splitting on a line break, we're gonna split on the space character. And then that'll give us an array of two elements. So we want the zeroth element to be the opponent's move and element at index one to be our move. And let's just make sure that that's working before we move on. And it looks good, so the opponent's move is A, our move is Y, that's what we expected. So before we go any further, I just wanna clean this up a little bit. We can use something called destructuring to basically do all of this at once. So we can assign both of these variables at once using this destructuring notation, it kind of looks like an array. And then something to notice is that on the right hand side here, moves at zero, moves at one, well, that's basically what the moves array is already. So we can just write it like this. And then really we're only using the moves array in this one instance, so we can actually assign it even more directly. So right off the bat, we can just say that opponent move and your move is assigned the value of game.split on the space character. And it looks like that's still working, so that's perfect, we can move on from here. Oh, and by the way, this thing we're returning here, this is called property value shorthand. And this is something you can use in an object basically when the key and the value are the same. So it's basically the same as writing it out both times, but it's just a nice shorthand so that we don't have to. Okay, so for this function, we need to get the game score. So basically whether we win, lose, or draw, we need to get the move score. So the extra points that we get just for playing the move. And then we wanna add those together. Now to get the actual scores of these things, we could do a bunch of if and else statements and stuff like that, but I wanna use something called a lookup table. So basically that's just gonna be an object where the keys represent the actual move name, so like A, B, C, or X, Y, Z, and then the values will represent the scores that correspond to each of those. We'll start with a lookup table for the move score because I think it's gonna be simpler. I'm gonna call this move values, and basically it's just the number of extra points we get for playing each move. So X represents rock, that gives us one point. Y represents paper, that gives us two points. Z represents scissors, and that gives us three points. So the way this is gonna work for this sample game example is once it gets split up, your move is gonna have the value of Y. So when we do move values at Y, it's gonna give us a value of two. So our move score is gonna be two. And that's basically it for that lookup table. So we'll just make sure it's working. Great, yeah, we're getting two. Okay, so now, the other lookup table is gonna be a little more complicated because we have a few different outcomes to consider. We're gonna to need to look at both the opponent's move and your move. So we're gonna do this with nested objects. So basically we'll just have a different lookup table for each of the opponent's moves. 
So if the opponent is playing rock and we play rock, we'll get three points because that's a draw. If they play rock and we play paper, we'll get six points because that's a win for us. And if they play rock and we play scissors, we'll get zero points because they beat us. And then we'll just continue with this. So if they play paper, then we get zero points for rock, three points for paper, six points for scissors. And if they play scissors, then we'll get six points for rock, zero points for paper, and three points for scissors. Okay, so just to do this one step at a time, let's start by getting the actual uh, inner lookup table. So for now, let's just call this relevant game values. And it's basically just going to be game values at opponent move. So if the opponent move is A, it's just going to give us this first object where X will have a value of 3, Y will have a value of 6, Z will have a value of 0. And then we'll get the actual game score by looking up our move in the relevant game values table. So in this case, since it's Y, that'll give us 6 points. And that gives us a value of eight, which is six points for winning the game and two points for playing paper. Great, so it seems like this is working just the way we want, but we could simplify it a bit. So instead of using this relevant game values variable, we could just do this all in one. So it's just gonna be game values at opponent move at your move. And this is basically just the same as the way we'd work with a two dimensional array. Okay, great, so that still works. Now we have our function for calculating the score. So now we can use that to get the scores of all the games. So this is a similar situation to what we were looking at in the previous day's challenge, where we had an array and we wanted to do the same thing to each element of the array. So that's a perfect use case for the dot map method. This time for each game, we just want to apply this get the score function to the game. But if you remember from last time, we're basically just saying, well, take the input and then give us the output of the get the score function with that same input. Well, that's what the get the score function does on its own. So we can just write it nice and simple, games.map of get the score. And it looks like that's working, so that's great. These seem to match the values from the problem description. So the only thing left to do now for part one is to add these all up. And that's another thing we looked at yesterday. So if you recall, we talked about how this is a perfect use case for the reduce method. So just like last time, we'll use the same reducer. The accumulator is gonna be called sum, and we're just gonna add each element to it, and it's gonna start at zero. Okay, perfect. So now we should get 15 when we run this, and there we go, 15. Now that it's working with our sample input, let's test this out with the actual puzzle input so we can get our response. And I'm using this summon puzzle input asynchronous function to just grab the puzzle input directly. That's not something you have to do. If you want to just grab the puzzle input, you can copy it into your code. You could save it as a file and get it that way. It's totally up to you how you want to do this. I just like being able to do this in the browser console. I think it's nice. We never even have to look at the puzzle input this way. One thing I should probably note is I added a dot trim to the response here because otherwise the string comes back with an extra new line character at the end. And that can kind of throw off the output because when we parse it, we'll basically have an empty string at the end and our lookup tables won't know what to do with that. All right, so I'm going to run this and we get a value of 10,718. Let's see if that's what we're looking for. All right, nice stuff. So we've got our first star. Let's take a look at part two. Oh no, it looks like we actually made a bad assumption here. The elf has returned and he's basically explained that X, Y, and Z don't represent rock, paper, and scissors. They represent the expected outcome of the game. So basically it's X if we're supposed to lose, Y if we're supposed to draw, and Z if we're supposed to win. So we're gonna have to make some changes to our code. I'm gonna start out by just writing a few notes so that we don't have to go back to the problem description again. And now we're gonna use a very similar strategy using lookup tables. But now in order to calculate the score, we first need to figure out what move we even need to play. So if the opponent plays rock and we need to lose the game, we'll need to play scissors. If we need to draw, we'll also need to play rock. And if we need to win, we'll need to play paper. If they play paper, then we'll play rock to lose, paper to draw, scissors to win. And if they play scissors, then we'll play paper to lose, scissors to draw, and rock to win. So I'm just using the strings R, P, and S to represent our actual moves. And then we'll use another lookup table to get the actual values of those moves. 
which are one, two, and three, just like in the previous part of the problem. And then just given the x, y, or z, we actually know now what the outcome of the game is gonna be. So we'll just make this lookup table that's gonna give us zero points for a loss, three points for a draw, and six points for a win. All right, now we can write our function to get the actual score here. We'll start by doing the destructuring thing, just like last time, except now it's not the opponent move and our move, it's the opponent move and the game outcome that we've been given. So from here, the plan is that we're gonna find out which move we need to play, we'll get the game score, we'll get the move score, and then we'll add them up. And we'll do all of that using these three tables that we have. So in order to figure out which move we're gonna play, we're gonna do a similar thing to the last section where we did our nested lookup table. We're gonna say required moves at opponent move, and then get the game outcome from whichever lookup table that gives us. The game score is gonna be the more straightforward part. In this case, we're just gonna say actual game values at game outcome, because we already know whether it's a win, draw, or loss. And then for the move score, since we now know our move, we can basically just look up the value of it in our table. Okay, so just to test this out, we'll use the same example as last time, A, Y. And let's see if this is accurate. So the opponent played rock, and we want the game to be a draw. That means we're also gonna play rock, which gives us one point, and then we get three points for the draw, so one plus three is four. Looks like we got the right answer. So since this function is working, we can actually apply this to all of the games and get the full list of scores. And then we'll just add those up using our reduce function. Since we wanna use the same reducer as the previous part, we'll just give it a name and we'll use it in both places. And once again, we're gonna start that at zero. And now for the actual total score, we're getting 12. And that's the same value that they had in the description. So I think that's a pretty good sign. We'll just put it into the console to test this out. And that's giving us a value of 14,652. All right, let's try plugging that in. And nice, all right, we got our second star. So that's perfect. All right, so we've solved the problem. It's all working. The elves must be very happy. Let's now just talk a bit about how we could do this a little bit differently. I think this is a pretty efficient solution, but there are a few other ways we could write it out that might be interesting. So I'm just gonna go back to the sample input, and what we'll do is log the values for part one and part two, which should be 15 and 12, and now we'll just modify the code and we'll make sure it's running with the sample input, and I think we can be pretty confident that it's still working in that case. Reviewing our solution to part one, we basically used two lookup tables. We used a two-dimensional lookup table for the game values and a one-dimensional lookup table for the move values. But if you think about it, we could actually combine these. Because if we're looking up our move in the game values table, for example, let's say it was X, then we already know that we should get one point for that, no matter what the opponent played. If it was Y, we know we should get two points, and if it was Z, we know we should get three points. So what we could do is actually just add on these values to the game values, values. <laughs> so instead of three, it'll be four. Instead of zero, it'll be one. Instead of six, it'll be seven. And then for all the ones with a Y, we can add on two to those values. And for all the ones with a Z, we can add on three to those values. And now we won't need two separate lookup tables. We can just get all the values in one. So we won't need to get the game score and move score and add them together. We'll just get this single score. And now it almost seems kind of wasteful to do this dot split because we're only using opponent move once and we're only using your move once. So we could actually do this in a way that we don't split that up. Instead of using a two dimensional table, we could just do a one dimensional table where the keys have both the opponent's move and then a space and then your move. And we'll just use all the same values as we had before in the two-dimensional table. Great, so now this works. And another nice thing about it is, since we're just returning one thing here, it doesn't need to be a multi-line arrow function expression. So we can just have the input and the output here, and this is looking really simple. So I would say this is probably as good as it's gonna get, but just for fun, there's actually another kinda silly way that we could do this. Basically what we could do is kind of reverse the score values table. So instead of giving it a string and getting the number from it, we could basically take all these numbers and use that to order these strings and then do like an index of. So we could actually just use a single string here that has all of these move pairs in order. And then we'll just do index of, we'll divide by three and we'll add one. So to see how this is working, 
let's just say the input was cy. When we do score values dot index of cy, that substring will start at an index of three. So then we'll do three divided by three, which is one, add one to it, we get two. And if we look at our old table, cy should give us a value of two. To look at another example, let's say we had ax. So that substring will start at a character with index nine. Nine divided by three is three, plus one is four. ax should give us a value of four. So this is a really weird way to do it. Again, we can just write this as a single line arrow function. And now it's looking very, very compact. I mean, compared to what we had before, this is a really, really small amount of code. But is it better? I would actually say no. And the reason is when we do this index of, it actually needs to search the whole string from the very start until it finds the substring. And that's not too bad because it's not a very long string, but it's still adding more computation time. Because when we had it in the form of a lookup table, that's just constant. It just goes directly to the value it needs. So it should be a bit better in terms of runtime to use the table. And it's definitely a lot better in terms of readability. So I would recommend using some form of lookup table rather than this string strategy. Okay, so I think that's sort of the optimal form for part one. Let's take a look at part two because this part actually had three lookup tables. And so maybe we can consolidate these a little bit. So the first thing to notice is that we're using this R, P, and S to get the actual moves but we're actually only using those strings to send to this actual move values table where we then convert it into either one, two, or three. So we could just cut out the middleman there and just replace all of those R's, P's, and S's with ones, twos, and threes in our required moves table. And now that's the thing that's actually giving us our move values. So we'll change the names around a little bit. But that's nice, because now we have only two lookup tables instead of three. So now it's actually pretty much in the same state as what we had in part one before. So it shouldn't be too surprising that we can now put these two tables together into a single two-dimensional table. And then we could convert that into a one-dimensional table. And if we wanted, we could make it a string, but I think I want to keep it like this. So now both functions are still working. We're getting both of the values we expected and it's all looking pretty nice and efficient. We've cut down the amount of code. It's still pretty readable. I think this looks good. I'm happy with what we have here. I think everyone did a great job. For part two, I was kind of thinking the elf might come back and say, find a way to get the maximum score based on what the opponent's moves are. So I thought that might be an interesting challenge, but then I kind of realized that you'd get the maximum score by just winning every time. So it wouldn't really be that much more interesting than what we've already done here. What might be kind of neat is if we doubled the move scores, then there might be some situations where we might want to play scissors and get those six points instead of actually winning the game. So that could actually make for an interesting problem. I'll leave that as today's bonus challenge. So feel free to make a comment about that or you can share your code on the Coding Serenity Discord. Either way, thanks for watching and remember, the first step is believing you can do it. Bye.